This week on Motor Week, Richard Hammond tries to save money on his motor by taking a trip to Belgium. Import enthusiast Eve Tate puts Japanese imports under the spotlight. Chris Goffey drives the Prowler, whilst Ian Cool Royal cruises in American cars. Any manufacturer of any product will tell you that they'll sell that product at whatever price the market will stand, whatever people will pay, and that's fair enough. That applies to cars as much as anything else. But what if we don't want to pay that price? It's now a fully integrated European market, so we can go wherever we want to buy whatever we want. And if I want to go to Belgium to save thousands of pounds on my new car, there's nothing to stop me. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. That's why I'm here, almost at the feet of the White Cliffs of Dover, at a horrendously early time of the morning. My hotel from last night is over the road, and my ferry awaits over there. Because we're off to Belgium, and we're going to save money on our car, we hope. Of course, we're given all sorts of reasons for the enormous disparity in car prices across Europe and in the UK. For instance, manufacturers will tell us that in the UK we have our own specific specifications. Yeah, so an extra couple of square feet of velour and an electric window is worth thousands of pounds. Also, they'll say it's complicated because of the badge difference, for instance, Vauxhall and Opel. Yeah, is it really that complicated to mean it's going to cost thousands of pounds more per car? Or is this just an excuse that fudges the issue and makes it too complicated for us to understand why we, the buyer, are being ripped off? Ah, la belle France! We've arrived. Another factor that does add to the artificial inflation of the prices we pay in the UK for our cars is our love of the company car. Manufacturers offer enormous discounts to fleet buyers for company cars in return for them purchasing huge numbers of cars. That's good for the manufacturers. It ups their share of the volume of the entire market and establishes them in the marketplace. But it's bad for us as private buyers because we indirectly subsidise the enormous discounts that they're offered. That pushes up the price that we have to pay in the UK. I don't like it. Oh dear. I don't think much of the beach. Anyway, which was Belgium? And I better go and get some foreign currency. Or they'll tell us that it's down to fluctuations in the exchange rates. Well, sure, it's going to have an effect. But can it really account for that much money per car? And isn't the arrival of the euro going to mean it's not a valid excuse anymore, is it? OK, some quick sums. It's cost us 27 quid on the ferry so far, but then we've saved that on our duty-free anyway. Bruges is only an hour from Calais, so not much petrol, and we had a nice lunch on the way. All I need to do now is find some car dealers. But we've had word that Rover dealers in Europe are quite happy to sell UK buyers a right-hand drive version of any Rover, thus offering considerable savings. There's only one way to find out if that's true. I'll ask them. Philippe, if I come here from England and say to you as a Rover dealership, can I buy a right-hand drive car? Can I? Yes, no problem. You can supply that for me, no problem. Okay. I'm not the first to do this. How many people have you had doing this? Um, once or twice in a week, they ask me for prices. Uh, we delivered five to England yet, I think. What cars? Uh, mostly Freelander. Range Rover or MG F. So there it is, one right-hand drive UK spec Freelander sitting here in Belgium waiting for its UK owner to come over and get it. Couldn't be easier. Big savings to be made thanks to Rover here in Bruges. I reckon Belgian car dealers must be doing quite nicely out of this. There's plenty of UK trade and good for them. So we try one of the German manufacturers now. Obviously, I'm in Mercedes dealership here in Bruges. This is Paul, who's the sales manager. Paul, thanks for talking to me. Thank you. If I come to you and say, I can't afford to, but if I did come to you and say, will you sell me a UK spec right-hand drive Mercedes, will you? Of course, no problem. What kind of savings are we talking about? Um, it all depends a little bit on the model that you're looking for. It would be on an A-Class, uh, which is our basic model, would be around two and a half to three thousand pounds. It can go up to uh, ten thousand pounds on the more uh, expensive models. You're obviously aware that we pay more in the UK for cars because people come here and save that kind of money. Yes. Do you have any theories, what theories, on why it's so much more expensive in the UK than here? Not really. Basically it's the same car, so uh, apparently it all has to do because of the specificity of, of the English market. It seems to be that you have a market with a lot of uh, big fleets uh, buying cars at the uh, lower uh, 
better prices and then uh, that uh, people who buy them as an individual uh, maybe pay the difference uh, in, uh, for the fleet services. Well, it couldn't be much easier than it has been so far. Let's try BMW. There's one over here somewhere. I don't believe it. I've just seen an M Coupe in there for the same money as a Fiat Coupe. Nearly every car in there was already right-hand drive anyway for export to the UK for UK private buyers. So some people have obviously sussed this already. Well, they couldn't have been more helpful, but I'm on an even tighter budget than that. So I need to spend less. And we've got a Citroen one over here, so let's see what they can do for us. This is every bit as easy as buying a car in the UK. They seem to speak better English anyway. This is a Citroen dealer on outside now. And they'll sell you this car that we drove down in today. A Citroen Saxo VTS, 1.6, 16 valve. It's a little flyer. They'll sell you it in absolute UK spec, down to the last wheel nut, right-hand drive, for a shade under £10,000. And wait for this they'll discount it by another 8%. Pay your VAT and you've got a VTS for about £10,000. It's unbelievable, that's, that's second-hand money. Where's my checkbook? I had heard that there might be problems in coming over here to buy a car and take it back to the UK. But in every single dealership that we visited today, it couldn't have been easier. They couldn't have been more friendly. And I would say, don't even think about the money you spend to get here to Bruges. I've had an absolutely great day. The place is beautiful, the buildings are stunning, there's bridges everywhere, and even some of the Belgians are nice to look at too. And those savings to be made are enormous. There's nothing to stop you coming over here to Belgium or anywhere else in Europe to buy a brand new car for second-hand car money. We reckon that with pressure from the press and the public, it'll be two years max before UK prices are brought down and forced into line with the rest of Europe. Mind you, a salutary note, if that does happen, don't forget, that will bring down the resale value of your car when you come to sell it on second hand. I learned something the other day. I always thought hot rods were something that American teenagers built out of old Ford V8s. Not true. The term comes from the 1920s in Britain when a Rolls-Royce engineer was asked to develop a racing engine for an air race and he got 1,500 horsepower out of a, an engine that had previously only developed 800. His name, Rodwell Banks, hence Hot Rod. This is a name that's much more familiar, Plymouth. And this is the Prowler. It's the only Hot Rod made by a mass manufacturer. When I say mass manufacturer, they're going to make 3,000 of these things, and Pr Plymouth say there's currently 30,000 on the waiting list. So, why do so many people want a car like this? The answer, it's dramatic good looks. I mean, it really stunned the motoring press when it was first shown at the 1996 International Motor Show. Since then, only three have come into the country. This is one of them. And there's going to be no more either because SVA, Special Vehicle Approval, simply will not cope with the way the lights, the bumpers and the front wings are organised on this car. And Chrysler, who make Plymouth, say they're not prepared to compromise and change the car just for British law. So this is as many as you're going to get. The concept is simple. You take the classic lines of the old American hot rod, an aluminium chassis, aluminium independent suspension front and back, a 3.5 litre V6 engine chucking out something over 220 brake horsepower, four-speed automatic transmission, and there it is. The essence of the old hot rods was their simplicity. And despite its dramatic looks, the Prowler hasn't really changed any of that. So I remember seeing this at the, the 1996 show. I mean, how, how come you've got one here? Well, I saw it at the 96 show as well. It was hanging up, if you remember, on some sort of racking. Um, fell in love with it there. And there's a friend of mine who deals in performance cars in Canada. I happened to be talking just a while ago and said, if you see a Prowler, can you get one for me? Expecting a two-year wait. Mm. And a week later, he came back and said he had one for me. Is it a rude question to ask you what you paid for it? Yeah, just a little. <laughs> <laughs> a slight premium. <laughs> yeah, just a slight a, premium. A big premium, a big premium. Um, and uh, any trouble getting it uh, to, to be legal on British roads? Um, nothing major. We spent about a thousand pounds on it, on having the lighting altered and changed around, but nothing major, nothing major. So David, the only one in the country, what's it insured for? It's insured for 80,000 pounds. 
And, and you're prepared to let us drive it? Yeah, sure. <laughs> And it does go as you imagine an old hot rod Ford really would. It's quite funny looking into the eyes of drivers coming the other way as well because they perceptively widen as you come round the corner. Chrysler claimed that this has European standards of steering, road holding and handling. Not quite sure where they get those European standards from. It's very light aluminium chassis, aluminium suspension and a composite body shell means the whole thing is very light so even though it's a V6, it's a enough go. This automatic transmission is interesting, it uh, converts to a sort of slap shift and you can go up and down through the gears just bashing it either way. A bit frightening on the move because with the left hand drive here you simply cannot see that offside front wheel and the car's wider than you think. Now if you did come to the top of the waiting list in the States you could drive away in your Plymouth Prowler for around 25, 26,000 pounds. If you wanted to buy this, which is the only one in the country, it's 80,000 pounds. I know exclusivity comes expensive, but that's very expensive. Would I like one? Well, I have to say that uh, a wet Monday in Essex doesn't really compare to a sunny day down the King's Road. But even so, can't resist one more drive. After the break, Eve Tate examines the pros and cons of importing Japanese cars. And Ian Royal drives the American dream. Eve Tate, having seen the media coverage of savings to be made, decided to investigate importing a car from Japan. At first I thought Dublin was a place to go, but then I decided to research the subject further. This proved a wise move. Eve discovered that larger importers dealt directly with Japan. Eventually she found a Japanese company with offices in London. Eve decided to pay them a visit. Believe it or not, behind this subtle exterior there lies a very reputable importer. What makes Japano Car different to other importers of Japanese cars? Well, first of all, we're a Japanese-owned company. We can cut out a lot of the, the middle nonsense, which uh, a lot of the, um, how can I say, uh, there's some very high quality importers out there, um, but there are a few which are a little bit dubious, and they tend to go for, they tend to choose an agent that um, is very protective about them. In other words, that they're picked up from the airport, they're taken to a hotel, they can't speak the language, they can't even order food because they can't read the menu. We don't have that problem, so we can actually pick out the right agent by total uh, uh, process of elimination and actually make sure that we actually get quality and, that's, and also it shipped over in a, in, a fair, in a very secure manner. So the auctions are required by law to provide detailed information about the cars? Yes indeed they do. Um, I mean this is an, the Japanese auction sheet which I just happen to have here for ease of reference. It tells you the lot number which you can pick up on a computer screen or in front of your desk. You've got a little credit card slip that uh, if you bid up to the amount you want to bid, uh, then it's automatically deducted from your card. It's very high tech. I mean, you, you don't really have to go and see the cards, which is uh, one of the, the benefits which I have, because um, we can just pop up the details on the car. And by law in Japan, it must tell you if there's a, a full report, you know, how many kilometers it's done, if it's had a wing replaced, uh, if it's got an oil leak even. And this is something that a lot of people can't understand when they go out to buy there. And sometimes unscrupulous agents will not tell them. Do you offer help or advice on servicing and insuring the cars that you supply? Oh indeed we do, yes. yes. We have a full after aftercare policy whereupon people can come back to us and have the car serviced or they can have it elsewhere and we can guide them where they can have the car serviced. And another crucial thing I think about aftercare is Getting back to this Japanese connection is that we can advise our customers on any recall that is being called out in Japan. Right, well I've had the car for about a month now 
and I have to say I'm really pleased with it. It's everything I thought it would be and I still save money. But there are one or two areas that are appearing to be a little niggly. The first problem that you're likely to encounter will be insurance. I personally found it was rather complicated. Three companies said no. When I finally got to a company who would insure it, there was a premium to be paid, about £100. Having got over that hurdle, you then need to consider servicing and parts. There are a lot of dealers that won't touch imports with a barge pole, and there's a whole variety of reasons why. If they won't, there are plenty of good independents out there, and also consider the importer you bought it from, or other large reputable importers who have now had the foresight to actually start their own servicing departments and parts. Premiums to pay on them? Not really. Not if you search around. There's a bit more legwork to be done, but still you can have lots of good driving, fast, fun, and you don't pay too much for premium, and you still save money. Whilst there are savings to be made by importing a car, other legal aspects such as changing the lights to UK specification must be considered. Fitting fog lamps, recalibrating the speedometer and odometer from kilometres an hour to miles an hour must also be looked at. Another annoying and easily overlooked modification is the radio which will be set up for Japanese frequencies. Tyres may also have a lower rating than will be required in the UK because of the 55 mile an hour speed limit in the land of the rising sun. Always have your import inspected by a qualified engineer to make sure that all of these modifications have been made. Finally, have an alarm fitted to your import. Car theft isn't an issue in Japan, but you will certainly need a security system fitted for UK insurance. America is the land of the free. Junk food, incredibly cheap petrol, and of course, incredibly big cars. And whenever I go to the States and ask for a rental car, I say, give me the biggest barge you've got. Well, not quite the size of this, but you get my drift. American cars are very big. They don't call them Yank tanks for nothing. So it's interesting that General Motors and Vauxhall have decided to import one of the biggest Yank tanks into the UK and in right-hand drive form. It's this, it's the Cadillac Seville. It's a very big car, as you can see. However, it's not quite as big as maybe an S-Class or an Audi A8. It is actually slightly shorter than those. So the cost of this Cadillac Seville is 40,000 pounds. Is it a good buy or is it bye-bye to your hard-earned cash? Now, it'll be interesting to see how the value of the Cadillac stacks up in about three years' time. Residuals, we don't know about, but don't expect them to be fantastic. Now, if you'd wanted an American car beforehand, you, of course, had to go to a specialist American car importer. And there are good and bad ones of those. You'd, of course, have to settle for left-hand drive. You'd probably find much more choice and perhaps better value for money. So it's interesting that these cars are now available in right-hand drive, along with the other car that Vauxhall are importing, which is a 4 by 4 called the Chevy Blazer. And both cars apparently are selling like bacon butties at a bar mitzvah. But it's under the engine that's quite interesting. Take a look at this beast. It's an amazing engine and very, very powerful and quiet. So the Seville's not a bad car, it's good value for money at about £40,000, but you almost get the feeling that it's a slightly sanitised American car, particularly for the British market. So let's go and see some real American cars. Well here we are in what is the biggest importer in the UK of American cars with me, Lawrence Millett from Bauer Millett. Lawrence, what sort of person typically buys a left-hand drive American car, whether it be a sports car or a 4x4 or a large limo type vehicle? Um, someone who would like to buy something quite individual, a little out of the ordinary. Um, as you can see, our, most of our product is quite uh, uh, unusual, different, not very expensive, despite what you might think uh, as you'll see as we go around. Um, they're really good value for money. For a lot of people, they see them on their holidays or travelling around, particularly in the States. Uh, very often they've rented these kind of cars. This is a special one, isn't it? Tell us something about this. Yes, this is a, a new Chevrolet Corvette C5. 
these were brand new 18 months ago um, and for General Motors has been a major success. Uh, this particular one is an Indianapolis pace car uh, which interestingly they built just one for the UK um, and this is that car. What's under the bonnet of this beast? Uh, 350 horsepower, um, small, what they call a small block V8 of course, uh, but this car do a, would do a 0 to 60 in 5 seconds, 175 miles an hour, uh, it's very very quick, incredibly reliable as well which is unusual for a very high performance car. This is a world class car as well, steering, Jump in and start this handling, thing up for us. just yes. have a listen. So the engine note on this, this is how an engine should sound. Absolutely That's amazing. Cool. So what a real sports car. What sort of price would this, this car sell for? Uh, these start at 38,000 and this one would, this particular one is a convertible and a one-off pace car. Uh, this is for sale around 47,000. Now from that, let's wander through here because it's kind of almost sublime to the ridiculous in a manner of sense. So, an American car, left or right hand drive, is it right for you? Well, why not? Buy an imported one like these and they certainly offer tremendous value for money and fantastic reliability. They might drink a bit more fuel than your average motor, but for street cred, you really can't beat them. And coming soon, we'll take a look at pickups and trucks like this Chevy Suburban right here on Motor Week. Motor Week News. The DETR have put a clamp on clockers. All garages are now to register with the DVLA and the system will be set up so that potential owners of cars can check with them if they may be buying a car that could be clocked. Dealers face up to a £20,000 fine if they're found to clock cars. And Mitsubishi's double cab, the L200, has taken 56% of its market share in the UK. If this sounds great, remember, pickups only account for 0.13% of the market sold. In America, they generate 21%, but Ford now think we'll go pickup crazy over here and are introducing their contender, the Ranger, soon. <laughs>